My name is Paul Hubner. I'm the student ministry coordinator here at Kittery Point. Um, I guess Tim thought it was time to let me out of the basement and come up here, so I'm glad that he gave me the opportunity to do that. Um, we're going to be continuing. Thank you. We're going to be continuing our Rise Up series. Um, we're going to be talking about how, as Christians, we don't just have the message of salvation, but we also have practical tools to be able to equip us, to be able to have success in our day-to-day -day lives. So we've talked about anxiety already. We've talked about anger. And this week, we're going to be talking about perfectionism. So when I think of the word perfect, I think of coffee. Because to me... Few things are more important to me than a good, perfect cup of coffee. Like, that'll make or break your day. And I think that coffee is so important that at my wedding, uh, we had a espresso bar for all the, all the people there. So we had all sorts of different fancy drinks, lattes, macchiatos. And my process for that, I wasn't just going to be like, any old person can make this coffee. I said, it has to be the best of the best. So I talked to maybe three or four different vendors and when I got to that fourth one, I said, I know this is the guy. So I started talking to him, and he started telling me about how he has this single source origin for his beans, and how he has just like the system to everything that he does. And he keeps talking, and he starts talking about his machine. And it's a machine that looks something like this one. So he talks about how over in Italy, they have this expo for espresso, and there's tables and tables of espresso machines, but everybody's kind of crowded around this one table because it's the, the premier espresso. And he said, I bought that one because I know that's the best and I need the best product. This machine up there um, costs $8,000 to make a really fancy cup of coffee. But um, so he talks about that. I'm like, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. And so then he has the barista make, because he says, what do you want to drink? I'll have the barista to make it. So she makes it. And it comes out, and he's just kind of like, ah, oh, that's, not, that's not right. So he goes back over, and he, he kind of makes it himself. And he says, like, okay, this is, there's a system to this. And the temperature has to be within two degrees, otherwise it's going to be off. And you can't, like, let the shots lay there, otherwise the shots, it's, the shots die, like the term dead. And you can't, you can't serve that. So he goes, and he makes, he makes it himself, and he serves it to us. And... At that moment, I had two thoughts going in my head. The first thought was, wow, this is a guy that I want. He knows his stuff, and it's going to be great at our wedding. The second thought, I had been a barista for a few months prior to that, and I was thinking, I would hate to work for this guy because <laughs> this guy is just, he's just neurotic about everything. And I had been in that position where you have your manager over your shoulder looking at what you're doing. And I, when, when I had prepared coffee myself, I would be in situations where I'd be Okay, I'm making this drink, and I've done it 100 times before, but I know you're looking over my shoulder, and you're just waiting to tell me, like, what I'm doing wrong. And then you start thinking, like, okay, what could I do wrong? I could mess up this. I could mess up this. And then you end up inevitably messing up. And you start thinking to yourself, oh, man, like, I just really just messed up this opportunity. And I think a lot of us have that similar experience. Sometimes we have that person or that voice in our head over our shoulder that says, you're going to mess up. Like, you got to do this perfectly. If you don't do this perfectly, um, there's a lot of pressure on you to, to do things well. And so today, we're going to be talking about perfectionism. We're going to be talking about how sometimes we can view God as setting that standard for us. Sometimes we see a God that's holy and a God that's perfect, and we say, man, like, how am I going to measure up to that? And actually, the text that we're looking at is going to be in 1 Peter. So I want to, first, I want to read 1 Peter um, 1, 15 through 16. And it says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. So being holy just means to be set apart. It means God is perfect and we're not. God's holiness is actually what causes a gap between us and him. Because I'm sinful and God is not. God is the absence of sin. So somewhere... It kind of, this verse kind of says, okay, we have to conform to that standard that God is. If God's perfect, then I have to measure up to that level. God's calling me to do that. That's a scary task. And I think sometimes we can look at it and we can be like, okay, well, maybe if I just get like 51%, like the, the Old Testament law has 613 commandments in it. 
So maybe, okay, we get to heaven and God says, all right, you kept 580 out of 613. Congratulations, A. And we're, okay, good. But actually, that's not how God operates. That might be how some other, like the other major world re- religions operate. Like you have a scale and it's just like you can weigh your deeds. Have you done more good or more bad? But God doesn't view sin that way. In fact, James 2.10 says that whoever keeps the whole law but stumbles at one point is guilty of all of it. So that means all it takes is one mess up, one sin, to be in that position where you're completely separated from God. And if God's calling us in that verse to be holy, that's a very scary idea. Because I've, I've sinned in the past hour, like let alone my entire life. So I'm already at that bad standing. So how can God call me to be holy? How can God call me that standard when he knows I'm going to fail? That's a terrifying reality I think we're faced with. But maybe the source of your perfectionism doesn't come from God. Maybe it comes from another person. Maybe it's someone else in your life, like that, like a manager or, or a boss or a teacher who's over your shoulder saying, I need you to be perfect. Um, for me, that was freshman year. Um, I had an English teacher in high school. And I went up to her. As we had, well, as a class, about 30 of us, and she said, I don't think that students deserve A's. I think A's are a measure of excellence, and most students today are not excellent. And we were all kind of looking at each other like, what do you mean? Like, we're honor students, we get A's, that's how this works. And we're like, she can't be serious. But as we moved throughout the semester, we figured out that she was. And she was serious that like only one of her, or two of us was going to get an A in that class, um, no matter how well that we did. And she would set up her test so that she'd have, sure, your multiple choice. You can get 100 on that, but then there's a writing section. And she can mark that writing section up however she wants so that you don't get that grade that you thought you were going to get. And this aggravated us to the point where one of us, uh, my friend Matt, actually said, you know what? I really hate this, and you know what? Just to prove a point, I'm going to do something. He said he flipped to a random Robert Frost book because we had an assignment that said you have to write your own poem and then explain the literary devices and the rhyme scheme that you put in that poem. So he said, I'll just pull one copy-paste from this random Robert Frost book, and we'll see how she grades it. And we're like, you're nuts. Like, you're plagiarizing. If you you get caught, like, that's on your transcripts. Like, how are you going to get into college? Um, And he just, he said, I'm going to do it. Well, the good news is he didn't get caught. The bad news is Robert Frost got a B-. minus. (laughs) So... So sometimes we have that standard of perfection, and we can't measure up to it. It's, it's something that's unattainable. And if we just read these two verses, um, it seems like that's what God's calling us to. It seems like God's calling us to that impossible standard that we have so often either in our own head or from people that are around us. And I think that Abram was put in a similar situation in Genesis 15. Um, so Abram, a little background, he is the patriarch of Judaism. He is the person that Israel eventually comes out from. And to give you a little context for this verse, in chapter 15, God shows up to Abram and he says, hey, you're going to be the father of many people. And Abram says, yeah, great. Because this is the third time that God's appeared to Abram. And this is the third time he's promised exactly the same thing. But I'm sure Abram's kind of like, yeah, that's great. And actually in verse 2 he says, well, are you going to do it through my servant? Because now this is time three, and I'm pretty old, and my wife's pretty old. I don't think this is possible. And God kind of challenges him. He says, actually, this is going to happen. You are going to have a son. And he's, it's in verse 6, says, Abram believed and was credited to him as righteousness. So I think we need to remember that Abram has belief, even though he sees that as an impossible situation. And it goes on. God says, you know what? Just to seal this deal, I'm going to cut a covenant with you. I'm going to make an agreement with you. And he tells Abram, he says, go out and get several different kinds of animals. So he does, and he instructs Abram, he says, I want you to cut those animals in half, and I want you to make an aisle way that you can walk through. Um, So Abram goes, and he's obedient, and he does it. Then it says that God put Abram into a deep sleep. And then um, God says this, it says, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. 
Um, so he decides, and he says that he get, it will give him the land of the, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Amorites. And he goes down this list of all these different areas that his people will inhabit. And if you look at this verse, it seems kind of odd. Because even for sacrifices, like sacrifices, you put them on an altar and you sacrifice them to God. But what God is doing here, this is an example of just culturally what people would do when they cut a pact with each other. So if two kings wanted to make a treaty, they would say, all right, I'm going to... Um, bring these animals here, and I'm going to bring these animals, and we're going to cut them in half, and I'm going to talk about, let me say, what I want my part of the treaty is going to be. So maybe I'm going to promise you these 500 cattle, and I'm going to walk through these pieces, and you're going to walk the other way. You're going to promise me what your half of that covenant is. And the unwritten statement would be, may it be to me as it is to these animals if I break this promise. It's pretty much just like, I swear to death that I'm going to do this. So God sets up this with Abram. He says, you're going to have descendants that are as numerous as the sands on the seashore. But I'm sure Abram, in his mind, he's having doubts. I'm sure he's thinking, this is round three that God's telling me this is going to happen, but nothing's happened yet. And that's kind of, I'm sure he's having doubts. And he's thinking, is, if God's perfect, it's not because God's not holding up his end of the bargain. Maybe it has something to do with me. Maybe Abram's thinking, well, maybe it's because I sinned. And maybe there's this sin that's keeping me away from God, and God's not going to come and fulfill his promise. Or maybe there's something wrong with me biologically that I can't have this kid. Or maybe I have yet to build, like, a good relationship with my wife so that we can raise, like, a son in my house. And I'm sure these things are going through his head. He's like, yeah, sure, God, you're going to, this is the third time. Something's, something's got to give. Something's wrong. But what says that, I said that both parties would cross through these pieces as, saying, I have this half to bring, and I have this half to bring. But what happens here is says that God puts Abram into a deep sleep. So Abram is sleeping through this entire thing, and God comes in the form of a fire and passes through those pieces. And if you look, you're like, wait, if a treaty is happening, two people should be going through and saying, this is my 50, this is my 50. But God says, I'm going to give it my 100, and I don't even need you to do anything. And it's important because it goes back to that verse in verse 6 where it says, Abram believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's all that Abram brought to the table. He said, I believe. And God came through and he said, I'm going to give, I know that you're not going to be able to keep this part of the covenant, but I'm going to give you my holiness. I'm going to give you my 100% to make sure that this happens. Um, and so if God, um, so when God makes a covenant, he confirms it himself. When God makes a covenant, he confirms it himself. He doesn't say, all right, I'm ready. Why don't you come up here to the plate and you're going to strike out and I can just say, hey, you know what? I called it. I did it. You, you failed. God confirms covenants himself. When God makes a deal with you and God makes a promise to you, he confirms that promise himself. The security of that promise isn't in how you perform it's in how God performs. And since God is perfect, you have that guarantee. Um, so one of the things that is always said from this pulpit is that context is king. So I wanted to take you through um, Genesis a little bit to kind of illustrate what God's character is. And then now we're going to actually look at the context of First Peter to kind of cast some light on what um, verses 15 through 16 actually say. So by wrenching... 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16, out of context, like I did earlier, um, it can be easy to make it match our perfectionistic tendencies. It can be easy to make it say, oh, yeah, like this is something that I have to come up to God's standard to meet. But I think God's character is not like that. I don't think God calls us to step up to the plate and fail. I think God sets us up for success. And if we look at the whole context of 1 Peter, I think that that clarifies that picture. So we'll start with 1 Peter 1. Um, 1 through 2. So it says that Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles in dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. So right here we're beginning with a reminder that of who God is. So it, it's talking about the three members of the Trinity actively being involved in our salvation. And I think it's easy to, when we're reading these letters like this to look at, oh, well, this is just the introduction. It's Paul or Peter writing to an audience, blah, 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 grace and peace, blah, blah, blah. And it's just a copy-paste format. But it's really not. 
What, what's, it's important because these verses are informing the rest of the text. So he's saying, I want you to keep in mind that you have God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son intervening on your behalf. And it says, a very important thing, it says there that you have sanctification in the Spirit. So sanctification is just the process of being made holy, the process of becoming more and more like God each and every day. And it says that sanctification isn't rooted in ourselves, it's rooted in the work of the Holy Spirit. So it's important to keep that in mind that he's prefacing this whole letter with the idea that we've been given the ability to be holy by God himself. So if we keep reading in verse, um, in the body of the letter, it says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So Peter continues his emphasis on the cross. And the beautiful thing about Christ dying is that he didn't just die for himself. He died for our sake. He died to give us hope, to give in his resurrection, he gave us eternal life. And we've already won the day. At the end of time, we've already won because Christ has already died and he's been resurrected. And he's, he has that victory over the grave. And one of the important things to note in here is that we have inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. So the second point is that we have an inheritance kept by God's power. Our inheritance is kept by God's power. It's not something that I hold on to because I'm performing and I'm above average, and I'm at that 51%, I can say, okay, good, I have my inheritance in my hand. It's something that God has kept through the power of Christ on the cross. So the language here is important, too, because he says that it's inheritance. It's not like wages, or it's not earnings. It's not something that you're investing into a bank and um, like into a retirement plan, and then they say, okay, well, you finally reached the threshold where your retirement is secure. You're not that's not the language. The language is inheritance. Inheritance isn't something that's earned. Inheritance is something that's given. So let's say, hypothetically, your father owned the New England Patriots, and you grew up with a love for the New England Patriots, unlike myself, because I'm not a New England Patriots fan. Um, yeah, no, whoa, yeah. <laughs> I'll say it, I'll say it, but I'm not a New England Patriots fan. But let's say, I'd say the majority of this room probably is, um, so we'll say that your father owns the New England Patriots. And let's say you play football through college, and you do a pretty good job. And he says, you know what? Because you've done this great job, I'm going to put you on the team. I'm going to make you quarterback of the New England Patriots. So you start, you say, oh, this is awesome. I finally realized my love for the Patriots. And, like, I can be in the game. I can lead my team to victory. But the problem is, if you're quarterback, you being part of that team is a conditional thing. So if you go out there on the field and you start throwing interception after interception and you keep getting sacked over and over again, they're not going to start you on that team. They're going to say, yeah, you're going to get benched and eventually you're going to quit the team. You're not going to pay you the money to stay here. But that's a kind of a picture of like earning your wages. But the Bible uses inheritance and it says that you've been given inheritance. So let's, let's say that your father, instead of saying you can be a quarterback on the team, he says, I'm going to gift you in my will the New England Patriots. And you've, you get that in your will. At that point, there's nothing that you can do that's going to separate you from your love from the Patriots. You're going to be able to experience that, and you're going to be able to experience it in a way that it doesn't matter how you perform, you still own the Patriots. Even if your team loses every single game, you're, you're still in possession of the Patriots. You still get to see that love of the Patriots every day. And I think that's kind of a picture of how we have the security in Christ. That it's not something that we, like that quarterback, has to go out there and earn his wages every time he goes on the field. It's not like that. It's, we've already been secured in the work of Christ. We already have everything that we need. We don't need to prove to anybody that we need to be where we are. So, let's continue on in verse 6. So it says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while if necessary. You have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation 
of your souls. So the reality of this world that we live in, we're in tension. That our lives aren't perfect. And even though we are Christians and we have that victory in the future, like we have trials today. The life isn't, I, I don't know how many of you guys would say that life's just a cushy road, but it's not. It's something we have to deal with each and every day. And I think sometimes because we have trials, it's so easy to play the how come game. And it's so easy to say, why are these things happening to me? Is this something that I did? When we have situations that go around us, like maybe a loved one gets really sick, or you have a debilitating injury, or you don't get that promotion, a job that you've been working for so long, it's sometimes it's easy to say, well, why isn't this thing happening like it should have happened? Why am I not actually seeing the fruits of my labor? And sometimes you can blame it on yourself and say, well, maybe it's like some secret sin that I've done that uh, it's separated me from this good thing that God's promised me. Or maybe it's um, that I haven't done this really good thing. That he, just, like, just like Abram. Like Abram's in a similar situation where I'm sure he was wondering, like, why hasn't this promise been fulfilled? And sometimes we can look at trials and we can say, man, like, I'm going through this trial because I deserve it and because God wants to punish me for something. And as we said last week, that's not the case. It says in the Bible that God makes it rain on the just and the unjust alike. So rain would be considered like a blessing. So it, different things happen. And it's just like a mixed pot. It's not just that God says every good thing is going to happen for people who are followers of Christ. And it's not every bad thing is going to happen to people who are not followers of Christ. That's just not how our world works. And like last week, we looked at Job and how Job was a righteous man. But Job still went through tons of trials and temptations. And his life wasn't perfect. I don't think any of us would be like, yeah, Job's life where he loses all his possessions and he gets all these like body sores. Like, I want that. Like, that's not something that we want. So I think that sometimes we can misconstrue, like, what is the origin of these, these trials? But we look here and we see that we're given trials so that we can have our faith tested. And that not only that our faith can be tested, but that we can have the genuine faith in Christ that leads us to be better people. That's not just something where God is saying on a whim, like, all right, I'm going to just throw them a curveball just for the heck of it. Like, I'm going to make it something that I'm going to torture this person because I feel like it. Like, that's not the reason why we go through trials and situations, so that we can perfect our faith that we have. So moving on to verse 10, it says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in these things that have now been announced to you through those who have preached good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which the angels long to look. So he puts it into perspective for us here. And he says, we have a separation of the Bible between the Old Testament, which is before Christ, and the New Testament after Christ. And we are on that side where it's after everything has happened. People in the Old Testament, they had prophecies about this Messiah that was going to come. But it didn't actually happen. And I think it's so much tougher when we're in situations in life where maybe we're promised something. Or maybe... We're looking forward to something, and it's easy to have doubts because that thing hasn't happened yet. It hasn't been realized yet. And I think we're honestly in a privileged position because we have, we have the Bible. And the Bible says that Christ died, and on the third day he was raised again. So we have, it's already happened. It's not something where you have to look into the future and be like, man, I really hope this happens, and I really hope I have salvation in the future. It's already accomplished. And it says that angels long to look into these matters of salvation. We have access to something that people from ages before us and even angels say, man, I'm jealous of the position you're in. I'm jealous that you get to experience the love of Christ, that you know everything that Christ has done for you already. Um, and if they could trust him that Christ would come before he came on the scene, how much more faith does that give us to be able to realize the same situation? So we're going to keep reading. In verse 13, it says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action, and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, also be holy in your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So it's here that we encounter the passage that we came to in the beginning. And 
now we have the necessary background to make an accurate interpretation of what this says. The therefore in verse 13 um, makes us go back and say, well, what, what is therefore? So verses 1 through 12 is the therefore, what we just went through. That salvation that's been given to us by Christ is something that we have to keep in our mind. And unfortunately, that phrase, preparing your minds for action, is kind of lost in translation. So in Greek, it literally means to gird up your loins, which is like a really weird phrase. But Peter, he's, his audience is to Jews that are scattered throughout the world that aren't living in Israel. So he says... He says this to kind of invoke an image from the Passover. So in Pat, the story of Passover goes, Pharaoh has the Israelites in captivity. And Moses says, it's time to, for my people to be released. It's time for them to go. And God commissions Moses to rescue his people. But Pharaoh says, nope, this isn't going to happen. And Pharaoh's heart is hardened so that he doesn't go and release the people. Um, so God provides a series of plagues on the Egyptians so that eventually Pharaoh will relent and release his people. And that last plague is that the firstborn of every household is going to be killed. But God says, I want you to take a lamb and I want you to sacrifice it and put the blood on your doorpost so that the firstborn in your house won't be killed. So the Israelites all did this and they were spared. But he also gives them specific instructions for how they're supposed to eat this lamb. So in Exodus 12, 11, it says, This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt and your sandals on your feet. And um, you're supposed to, it's just this image of being ready. And so in like that ancient Near East culture, you'd be wearing long flowing robes. I don't know how many of you guys have worn robes or how many women in the room have worn a long dress, and you try to run in that thing, you're going to be tripping in the first few steps. Like, you're not going to succeed. So he says, you need to, to the act of girding your loins is to take, take your clothes and tuck them in so that they're not in your way, so that you can run. And there's an expectation here. So there's an expectation that once God releases this plague, there's going to be a liberation. There's going to be freedom for the people of Israel. So he's saying, I want you to be so prepared that even before this happens, you're ready to run. You're ready to go. And you're ready for this salvation, that I got this deliverance I'm going to bring you from Egypt. And so in the same way, he's saying, therefore, preparing your minds, therefore, girding your loins. He's saying the same way you need to also be prepared. We need to be prepared for that salvation that's awaiting us. Just like the people in Egypt were ready for salvation from the Egyptians, We've been given freedom from something greater. We've been given freedom from sin and from death through the work of Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us. We now have access to that freedom. We're supposed to anticipate it and say, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to see Jesus face to face. And I'm ready to, when, when our time comes, I'm ready to see Jesus. And I'm not going to be looking at the face of someone who says, yeah, I guess you barely caught it. Like, come on in, I guess. We're looking at someone who says, I have saved you, and I have loved you so much that I've sacrificed for you, and you are completely covered. God views us as completely righteous because of the work that Christ has done for us. So if that's the case, sometimes when we set our minds to it, it says that we can, through the grace of God, strive towards perfection in our own lives. And we can be holy because our hope rests fully on Christ's grace. So we can be holy because our hope rests fully on Christ's grace. My hope doesn't rely on what I do. My hope doesn't rely on, well, today I did more good deeds than evil deeds, so therefore I'm success. Like, no, that's not how it's measured. That the context of these verses where it says be holy, God has given us every tool that we need to be holy because he's given us the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us to be able to be holy. And he's not calling us to rise up to a standard. He says, we're already there. We already made it. We've already made it because of what Christ has accomplished. We're already declared justified in the eyes of God. So we're going to keep reading in verse 17. It says, And if you call on him as a father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout your time of exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited by your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but is made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So, like I said before, Peter is addressing Jews that are 
not in the nation of Israel right now. And he's, he's reminding them that they can't set their hope on material things. They can't set their hope on silver and gold. And sometimes when we're being perfectionistic, we're setting our hope on what's here in this world. We're saying, I'm going to set my stock in being the richest person in my neighborhood, or I'm going to be the highest person in my company. And that's what's going to give me identity. That's what's going to give me purpose. But he's saying, no, 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 don't, don't do that because those things aren't eternal. Those things will perish. Those things tomorrow, they're gone. He's saying, instead, put your hope in Christ. Put your hope in the salvation that he's provided for you because that's something that's eternal. That's something that's always going to last. And we'll continue reading and finish it up in verse 22. It says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all of its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. So the work that Christ has accomplished on the cross, even though we as humans are finite, we are not something that is going to last forever. Because of what Christ has done on the cross, we have eternal life. We have the ability to live forever in him. And we have, we don't have this need to, like I said, we don't have this need to perform. I don't need to be in a state of judgment all the time. I don't need to be second guessing myself and saying, well, if only I did better today. If only I performed better for the people around me. If only I matched the standard that God has for me. Like God calls us to be holy because he's holy. And he, because he's holy, he's given us the gift of holiness. It's not something that we earn. It's not something that we obtain. But the only thing that matters is if you look back at Genesis 15, it says that Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham has that faith that what God is going to do is going to be realized in the future. And do we, we have that same hope. We have the same hope that what Christ has accomplished on the cross is something that we're going to see in the future. That salvation, we're going to have that perfection, that holiness. It's something that we all yearn for. It's something we long for, to be perfect. We long for this world to be a perfect place. And we're going to see it. It's not today, but it's going to be in the future. And it's secured not on a conditional basis of what we do here, but it's secured in the work of Christ on the cross, which is already finished. It's done by the love of Christ who loves you so much that he was willing to give himself for you. So let's pray. Lord God, I just thank you so much for your completed work on the cross. And I thank you that um, we don't have to perform, Lord God, that we don't have to be in a position where we beg you for um, just to accept what we have to offer. We know that in your word it says that our good deeds are like filthy rags. And God, we have nothing to bring, but you have everything to bring. Just like you brought Abraham, um, you went 100% of the way for him. You've done the same thing for us on the cross. You've given us all that we need for holiness, Lord God, through the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Um, thank you that you love us unconditionally and that there's nothing that we can do that will separate us from your love. And God, we just pray that we'd be able to live lives in comfort and that hope that we have in the future. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.